Hello everyone, this is the Cloud Lounge and uh, I am Enrico Signoretti, your host and moderator for this session. First of all, what is Cloud Lounge? Our idea is here is to have a space where we meet and chat about the latest uh, in our industry. So our focus is uh, mostly on cloud, of course, data and edge computing. Uh, it, this is an informal gathering, so you, you are free to comment, uh, chime in, uh, you know, you have opinions like me, and so it, it, the best way to interact is just to raise your hand. We will promote you, and uh, you can uh, uh, share your experiences, your ideas. Everybody's welcome. So um, we chose LinkedIn as the main platform for uh, this event. Actually, we are recording this. And uh, in, uh, we are going to start also a podcast with this content. So just uh, be aware that everything is recorded and will stay on the internet uh, forever. And, um, and last but not least, uh, um, uh, I don't know if you are uh, listening to uh, this podcast, this, I don't know, it's live show, talk show, whatever, uh, podcasts. But uh, both on your LinkedIn uh, web page or, uh, or um, mobile application, there is uh, a way to react to what we are saying. So you, you can use an emoji. You can ask to be uh, added to the, to the panel, whatever. Just let us know. So the format of Cloud Lounge is very uh, simple. We will pick three news per week uh, uh, that we find interesting. Uh, it could be about cloud, it could be uh, about AI. Why not AI? I mean, everything is about AI these days. Data security infrastructure, IT strategy, IT people. And then uh, um, we'll start commenting on it. I will, I will uh, kick off the conversation by reading it and uh, give my first comments, my first opinion on it. But you are more than welcome to, to join me. Uh, so the microso microphones are open. So I don't know. And uh, who knows where we'll, the, the conversation will bring us. We also plan, as I said, to record these sessions, to create a podcast, so to, to let other people uh, know what we are doing, why we are doing it, how we are doing it. And uh, last but not least, the schedule. So our plan at the moment is to go live every week on Thursday, 5 p.m. Uh, European time or... Uh, 8 a.m. Uh, Pacific time. We are trying to cover as many um, time zones as possible. But, you know, uh, also about this, we are um, open uh, to listen uh, to your feedback and see if uh, we need to change something. Um, so this event is not just only conversation. Sometimes we will record it uh, uh, during live events, trade shows, uh, in any special occasion that uh, we'll, uh, you know, we will find during the, the year. So without any further ado, let's start uh, with uh, this session. So what we have found uh, uh, for today. First of all, I want to talk about ransomware. And uh, yes, I know, ransomware is almost boring at this point. <laughs> Everybody talks about it. Everybody tried to sell a solution to... Uh, prevent, uh, you know, um, your company to be stopped by ransomware attack. But, uh, but there is still so much to talk about it because, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, I read this uh, news about uh, a report uh, uh, recently published where, you know, the, we have a lot of uh, um, new data about, uh, um, about ransomware. Uh, a research firm that uh, uh, started last year uh, collecting this information found out that uh, uh, after the US, UK, Canada, Germany, and Italy uh, are uh, the most attacked countries at the moment. And while it, it's clear that the US uh, is the, the biggest one, um, also, also because, you know, it, it's, a, it's a 300 uh, um, million people kind of country so it's huge but if you look at it in, um, it's interesting to note that UK Canada Germany and Italy are immediately after that and 
And my, my opinion is that in most of the cases, Italy, which is on top of, uh, of many of these attacks in, um, in, many, in many of these surveys, um, it's, it's all about the fact that most of these countries have very small uh, companies as the, you know, in, in big numbers. And uh, for many, um, for many of these companies, it, it, it's really tough. I mean, most of them have uh, uh, have experienced an accelerated digital transformation in the last uh, few years, just because the pandemic forced them to to do it. And now they have these small IT teams. Sometimes it's just one guy uh, and uh, not enough experience to understand. Uh, the consequences of uh, poor data protection, um, you know, not adopting the right technology, not having the, the right backend. So, I mean, it happens every day. Uh, I have this personal experience. It happened to me uh, a few weeks ago. A friend of mine with a very a relatively small uh, manufacturing company experienced firsthand uh, a ransomware attack. I mean, they, they have the class, they have the, the classic small infrastructure, couple of servers running uh, their local ERP, running all the um, all the CAD environment, including you know NAS files of any kind, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, what uh, they found is one day they, they found that everything was encrypted, and they were you know uh, really scared. They didn't know what to do. Uh, fortunately, after after you know talking to the IT guy, the guy was not able to recover anything. Then they talked with a, a first consultant. In the end, they found out somebody that was able to uh, to help them. But you know everything um, was possible because because they found a, an old backup. <laughs> they didn't even know they had this backup. Fortunately, a one month old backup, and they started restoring from them. Uh, this created a lot of issues for the company, including the fact that uh, uh, except some personal backup on some files, so they had to rebuild some of the knowledge that they missed, and uh, it disrupted the processes of the company, both business processes and production companies, for like a couple of weeks. It was a major loss for them. And, uh, and after that, of course, after the incident, they made a, a major investment, uh, considering the size of the company, and they trained the the IT guy, and uh, you know, and this is what happens most in most of the cases. So this is very common, but look like uh, you know most entrepreneurs still today think about their company as a moon of these attacks. I don't know your opinion on this. I, I see many people online, and maybe you want to join me and um, and tell me what's your opinion. I mean, so I, I'm really used to talk. Uh, because of my previous job with very large companies. And we started talking about ransomware uh, many years ago. And now most of them are protected or at least business critical systems are well protected. But when it comes to smaller companies, it becomes really, really hard. Uh, and, and I have plenty of stories of, of people that, you know, they, they don't really have a security uh, practice uh, internally, but and they think they are secure. They are doing the right backups. My, I was with my dentist. I, I published a, a, um, a story on, on, on LinkedIn a, a few days ago about uh, he was very happy for, with his uh, new 3D scanner and he's going to um, to scan the teeth of uh, the mouth of uh, his. Uh, uh, patients because uh, you know it's very efficient uh, and it brings a lot of data etc etc each single scan is 25 uh, gigabyte um, megabyte so it's huge compare everything else he did um, in the past and now he has to protect all this data talking about you know not just the, the the number of files the huge amount of data that is going to manage compared to what it was doing just before He's, he he has a three NAS systems, one uh, one in the office, another one in a, in an adjacent office, and one in the basement. And he thinks is everything is good, 
and it was very hard for me to convince him about the country. So think about it. I mean, the, this guy is uh, is uh, is a storing, is starting to store huge amounts of data, and uh, and incredibly, uh, he thinks that everything is fine and uh, everything will go, you know, in the right way and. Uh, his data is well protected, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, if you think about uh, also another aspect that was uh, highlighted by this report, that most of these attacks are becoming more and more sophisticated, and in many cases, uh, the attackers are not just encrypting your data; they are stealing your data first. So uh, back to the case of my friend manufacturing. So they they. Uh, they are very, very competitive in the market because they are very fast in designing new uh, new machinery. Uh, they, they bring new models to the market every year. But what happens if they are stealing uh, your data? So at some point, it won't be necessary to encrypt anything. Just they, they can tell you, look, I can share all your data with your competition or I can uh, really share it in the, uh, it in the wild. And you will, uh, uh, you know, you will lose uh, all your competitiveness in one day. The same goes for the dentist. I mean, what happens if this dentist uh, will get uh, all the, his patients exposed uh, um, on the internet? It's a, it's a major, it's a major uh, problem. I mean, most of these companies work. Uh, because they are trusted by their by the, by their customers, and and when you lose trust, you lo you lose credibility, you lose the possibility to do any sort of business. So this is a major uh, a major um, problem. What I found, on the other hand, is uh, it's really difficult today to find a simple solution, something that uh, that is secure enough that gives you. The, all the all the mechanisms, all the uh, let's say all the best practices that are integrated, included, and you just have to push a button and and be sure about that. I mean, in in large organization we have this uh, large IT uh, IT teams. We have uh, everybody in, in these uh, uh, teams that have a minimal knowledge to understand the basic security needs. Uh, they have a specific uh, people that is trained and can manage a security threat intelligently. But what happens in a small company? This is something that, you know, I really uh, struggled with. And I would like to, uh, to find a solution for these guys. I mean, even in the company um, I work uh, for now, I mean, we, we are trying to... Uh, uh, build systems that are, you know, easy to use and are compatible and are simple and, uh, you know, we use the latest APIs, et cetera, et cetera. But is this enough? We need something more, something easier, something to really make, make people secure by default. So, uh, and again, if you want to, uh, to chime in, I know this is the first time, it's also always difficult to, talk to a group of people but i see a lot of people online so just jump in and uh, uh, and give me your opinion if you want so uh another important news that i uh, read this week is about uh, uh, a report that comes from gartner uh, gartner said that 65 percent of the cios will deploy edge computing initiatives by 2025. Uh, from my point of view, it doesn't mean anything if you if you take this number, you know, uh, as is. But actually, it's a very interesting number because uh, if you look at this number in the overall IT strategy of many companies, this, uh, this is really, really important for a couple of reasons. So um, uh, on one end, uh, I see edge computing as a major use case for uh, for uh, the vast majority of companies I work with. Uh, they have to deal with uh, edge computing for, because most of the data is actually created and uh, accessed and managed uh, at the edge. 
So if we look at uh, what happened in the last few years, we saw that uh, uh, many enterprises, uh, you know, had this, uh, um, let's call it uh, um, cloud first kind of strategy, and they rushed to put everything on the cloud. Well, to discover later that the cloud is very expensive and, uh, uh, and it's inefficient for, you know, a lot of workloads. Um, I'm not saying that, uh, I mean, it's uh, it's bad or good, but actually, uh, again, probably also because uh, because the pandemic. So you, you needed a solution that is fast, agile, flexible, and the cloud is all of this. But at the same point, it's really expensive. So now we are talking about uh, cost, uh, cloud cost optimization. We are talking about uh, um, data repatriation. So all these topics are on top of uh, uh, priorities for, for many CIOs because they are spending too much and uh, they don't see, you know, uh, a future for this. So they are going back and uh, they want a much more balanced uh, approach. And, and uh, I started to call this uh, a few months ago, you know, the data first approach. So instead of having a cloud first approach, well, let's talk about the data first approach. Where the data is needed, where where are you accessing it, how, and uh, and then you can decide where to put it. So, uh, of course, uh, data uh, is accessed by application and humans, and uh, and of course you want uh, these applications and sometimes humans very close to the data. So you minimize the latency, you simplify the access and uh, you improve the user experience in general. So this is why the edge is really important. So, and this is why many companies are really uh, moving uh, uh, more and more of their infrastructure to the edge. So I'm not saying in this case that it's edge first, edge first doesn't exit of course, but it's, as I said, but data first or, you know, uh, common sense, balance it first. <laughs> that is a good approach. In this, in this regard, you see that there are many more uh, users developing applications that are using container and Kubernetes, for example. And in these cases, um, these application, these new applications need uh, uh, a persistent storage. You know that Kubernetes is not really good at uh, at uh, persistent storage, for example. Object storage is something that uh, gives you uh, persistent storage in a very simple way, in a way that developers really like because we are talking about APIs. So th this is a perfect solution. And of course, uh, th there is the fact that uh, mm, a lot of new application, a lot of uh, uh, modern application are now targeting S3 as uh, the main uh, uh, repository for, for their data for several reasons. I mean, uh, S3 can be considered a database from a certain point of view. It's a key value store at the end, but also it's uh, uh, it's easy to use. It is it easy to integrate with uh, with um, with applications. So if you have an S3 repository, of course you get a lot of uh, uh, potential uh, applications uh, in your hands. And uh, and well, and honestly, I also. I have to, you know, uh, put a disclaimer here because uh, you know me, uh, you know, you also know my level of bias when it comes to object storage. I love object storage. I love the way it, it works, and uh, and every time I can push somebody to <laughs> towards object storage, it's something that uh, that uh, I I really do. So again, uh, I know this is the first time. I see a lot of people listening. But uh, don't be shy. Uh, just jump in. Tell me what you think. And uh, if you have any, anything else that you want to add on these two topics, I mean, security, edge. And of course, security at the edge is another good, uh, uh, good conversation we may have. So, and uh, again, to, to the edge discussion, um, the reality is that uh, uh, today the definition of edge is really complicated. I mean, uh, edge is uh, 
different for uh, every company, every organization has, has a definition of the edge. Sometimes we are talking about the edge uh, with some uh, of our customers and they think about edge as the, you know, uh, everything that is not in their core data center or in the cloud. For others, we are talking about, uh, especially telco providers, they have tower stations. They are just uh, one, uh, uh, one step before the, uh, the last uh, uh, device that you can access uh, their infrastructure. So think about 5G. With 5G, many telco providers build these uh, uh, impressive networks and uh, where they have the telco towers, uh, they, they also have racks with, uh, with, uh, with equipment that they can uh, use to provide uh, uh, services at the edge. So you have this spectrum that is huge. How, how do you, um, you know, can, uh, how do you define the edge is the, is the first part of every, um, every conversation about edge. And, uh, and again, because you are talking about optimizing uh, and um, uh, while keeping the flexibility, it's important to to find uh, this uh, to to talk about this definition uh, at the very beginning of, of your discussion about edge, and then start from there to build your infrastructure that has to be balanced and has to provide the best service for your applications. In the end, data is at the core, but actually you access everything. Uh, through your application. So you have to provide the best user experience. And uh, and again, in the last uh, six, 12 months, I, I took it with a lot of uh, these companies. And uh, most of the cases, we are talking about very large companies and that consume data at the edge. And, uh, and they are finally understanding that it's not really the case to move all the data back. I mean, so... Um, they they want uh, they want to have this approach that is smarter, you know, storage at the edge. Storage at the edge is really tough because because it's not like uh, you have all the same resources. In many cases, we are talking about tiny, very tiny clusters deployed in a very unforgiving environments. So uh, building this kind of infrastructure is not always easy, but but again. Is something that is happening. For example, one of the uh, one of the discussion I'm having is with a very large uh, data center provider in uh, in the US and and in Europe, and they are building relatively small edge metro data centers. So they are providing uh, uh, all the connectivity in this in these huge data centers that they are building for companies like Amazon and many others. Uh, big players, but at the same time, they are building this edge metro uh, data center. So close to people, close to devices, close to where the data is really consumed to provide, uh, you know, next generation applications, to to, to reduce the latency, to, um, to connect this application to the data center, but in the middle, they put something that can do uh, most of the work before uh, aggregating the data in the large data center. So this is a, a, a new paradigm from this point of view. And this is really cool uh, for, for many of the users. And again, you know, if you have an opinion, uh, especially if you have an opinion that is different from mine, just jump in and, and tell me what you think. So last but not least for this week, and then uh, I think we will uh, wrap up uh, this episode um, also because we are close to the uh, to the top uh, of uh, of the hour in, in terms of uh, the episode we want to keep this episode 30 minutes long more or less so uh, last but not least I was talking uh, this week about data sustainability this is a new concept also for me I mean uh, I, I read a lot in the last few months about AI sustainability and uh, you know AI is very very energy hungry there are these huge uh, large uh, models that are um, crunched by this uh, um, huge uh, um, computer clusters, GPUs accelerated, uh, amazing stuff. But actually, the amount of uh, 
heat, the amount of uh, energy needed to to make this work is incredible. Okay. Uh, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I mean, not everybody has uh, access to all these uh, uh, training models and all this technology yet. I mean, we have Microsoft doing this. We have Chat. Uh, we have OpenAI. We have a, a bunch of others, Google, etc. They are really uh, fighting to for the leadership in this world, but actually the traditional enterprise, the, the regular enterprise is not yet there. What, uh, what you have though is huge amounts of data. And, uh, and I started to think, wow, this is really important. I mean, uh, we have customers with petabytes and petabytes of data and these guys really have a problem. I mean, so uh, of course the really hot data is not even the problem. I mean, today you have uh, uh, flash memory, for example. So the like five ten percent of your data is storage in all flash system. So block devices, uh, storage array, storage array network. This is not really the problem anymore. I mean, it's huge power consumption, but actually is minimal. Think about the ninety percent of unstructured data that is still active and still in your NAS system, in your object storage, everywhere, and it's still on hard drives. This is huge power consumption. Each, sing each single hard drive is seven watts. Before all the electronics, all the components that you need to make this hard drive accessible. This is huge. This is really, um, this could be, I mean, a multi-petabyte infrastructure could be very, very energy hungry. What can you do to make your organization more efficient and again it's not uh, it's not like that you, you can uh, uh, offload the problem to uh, an hyperscaler because in the moment that you uh, put all this data on the cloud you're paying an energy uh, you're pay a cloud bill and it's not that they are not making you pay for each single watt you are consuming okay so it will be better to rethink a little bit how we are storing the data and um, how we are building our infrastructure. Okay, Many of our infrastructure are not uh, anymore the kind of infrastructure that we had in, in the past with this uh, uh, forklift upgrade. So you, you bring everything. when So you have a, your old infrastructure and one day you choose, you make a major, uh, major uh, migration to a new infrastructure. You switch off the the old one and everything goes away and the new one is much more efficient, uh, smaller, etc, uh, etc, etc. Et no. Infrastructure are much more evolutive than in the past. The problem is that in many in many cases we we are underutilizing our infrastructure for example. So we buy 100 terabytes of storage because we today we think we have a, a certain growth over the next two, three years. So we buy in advance a lot of storage. And all this storage is running in your data center, consuming storage, even if you are working on one third of it or one fourth of it. And then you, you, you think for one or two years, you are building on top of it. And then at the end of his life, still, maybe you are at 60% of it, but it's too expensive to keep it running because the support contract is too much. There are the 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 salesman from, from the from the vendor comes with a very attractive office uh, offer for a, a new hardware so there are two problems one is uh recycling uh you uh, all the keeping which is very dif difficult and the other one is uh, uh is that you are you are really yes buying something new but again, you are ending up with the same problem. I mean, so you, you are buying more than you need probably, and then you hope that you will use it in the future. So how do you solve this kind of problem? Uh, I started thinking about it. I mean, uh, uh, and I don't want to, to talk about Cabit here because this is not the place where I talked about Cabit. Uh, but, but the idea is to think about the evolution, to start thinking differently about the storage infrastructure the entire infrastructure in general, but storage in particular, and think about reusing as much as you can of your infrastructure. So there are a lot of applications. And again, object storage is one of them. I mean, you don't need the latest uh, 
and the greatest hardware to run object storage. Sometimes recycle, recycle your existing infrastructure for applications that are, you know, maybe uh, they need less performance. And uh, then you can then you can use it. Especially now we are saying, okay, uh, last month uh, uh, when uh, when I started with uh, with a uh, cabinet two minutes ago now, uh, we. We were uh, talking with a with a customer. The next generation of Cabit DS3 uh, will have a, a functionality, and uh, uh, well, I don't want to spill the bean here. But but the idea is that this uh, this guy had, had a, like a two point five petabyte of storage, non uh, not really uh, utilized, uh, not really used at the edge, two point five petabytes, and I said, look. What about reusing all of it? You can build a huge system that you can reuse for backup for many other things without actually uh, spending too much money because you already have the hardware. You're already using it. You're already consuming the energy because you have, you know, the hard drives, the disks, the, the, all the infrastructure is there to run your business critical application at the edge. So... You don't need much more to to you know pull together all of this and then start rebuilding a new infrastructure for for something. So this this made me think a lot in the last few months, and I will come back on data sustainability very often in the next few uh, weeks and months. So, and with this, uh, this is the first uh, uh, cloud launch. Uh, thank you very much. A lot of you. Uh, online, I really appreciated that you know for the first uh, sound check you were here with me, and uh, again every Thursday, 5 p.m. Um, European time or 8 a.m. Pacific time, just uh, connect. I will update you as uh, as much as I can on what I do. Uh, what I meet, uh, wh who I meet in in the field, the kind of problematics I see, and, and of course, uh, I want to chat. So just let me know. Just jump in and uh, enjoy. So and with this, bye bye.